Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jessica Rockhold, and I'm the Executive Director of the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. And we would like to welcome you to our third presentation in the Auschwitz Speaker Series. Uh, Dr. Tim Cole is joining us today. Before Dr. Cole speaks, uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, George Costello, who's going to speak briefly about the Auschwitz exhibit and its run in Kansas City. George, you're still on mute. It's like a bad Saturday Night Live piece. It's like I decide to talk and I will, be, on behalf of all of us at Union Station, we'd like to say welcome. This is a great honor to partner with the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education in order to fulfill their mission in our community and to be a partner in such an important transformational experience in our community. It is uh, quite gratifying and uh, quite honoring. As we have now been uh, open a, a whopping uh, seven days, uh, we have been overrun by uh, customers. Uh, today, I'm pleased to let you know that in seven days, we have now sold 102,000 tickets to this exhibition and continues to grow stronger and stronger, as only you can see through these educational programs. When we decided to partner and asked uh, Midwest Center for Holocaust Education to educate us on this important topic and educate the community, um, the programs and seminars have certainly added a very important depth to this exhibition. And it is not just an exhibition now, it is a community movement as we educate all in our community, all ages, all races, all creeds, to understand the important work that Midwest Center for Holocaust Education is doing in our town. We never really had a Holocaust ex, uh, museum, but now we do. Well over uh, 20,000 square feet of artifacts that people have never seen before. But more importantly, we're doing programmatic that's making a difference in Kansas City. So on behalf of our board and all our dedicated team, we welcome you to this very important enlightening program that we will continue to do for many months to come. And if you haven't had a chance, please have a chance to look at our most recent On Track magazine. Uh, go on to unionstation.org and click on it. Great information that Jessica and Shelley have helped us put together. It gets the community ready for this exhibition that has really um, resonated with our community and our elected officials. So as the Washington Post uh, says, they can't believe a little town in Kansas has decided to bring this exhibition to our community. So whatever the Washington Post says, I guess it's right. So <laughs> doctor, it's a pleasure <coughs> having you and we look forward to learning from you. Thank you, Jessica, Shelley, thank you. Thank you, George. Um, <laughs> Just a, a quick logistical note, we are having a webinar today, and you'll be able to ask questions of Dr. Cole at the end of his presentation, but you can go ahead and put them in the Q&A feature. We're going to be joined at the end by MCHE's historian, Dr. Shelley Klein, who will moderate those to Dr. Cole, and we'll have a, a great conversation today. Today is the 80th anniversary of the invasion of the Soviet Union. Operation Barbarossa was a military campaign but immediately behind that front, following the active military, were the Einsatzgruppen. And what followed was the initiation of mass murder of over a million and a half people in the Eastern territories by bullet. So today we take a moment to, to commemorate that anniversary and to remember that um, the beginning of the genocidal process. When Shelley and I were first thinking about how to build this speaker series and, and what we wanted to present to Union Station for this partnership, one of the very first names that we both said was, we need to figure out how can we get Tim Cole. He does some extraordinary work and thinks about the Holocaust differently than some other historians. He thinks about it in terms of space and geography and his work has been really enlightening in, in the way that Shelley and I approach our teaching of the Holocaust. I was lucky enough to meet Dr. Cole, I think it was 2004, 2005, when his book Holocaust City was very new. And it was about how the movement of people, both Jews and non-Jews in Budapest, 
affected the Holocaust experience of the Jewish people. And he's gone on to, um, to continue this work. He is a professor of social history and the director of the Brigstow Institute at the University of Bristol. And his books include Images of the Holocaust and Selling the Holocaust, Holocaust City, and uh, Holocaust Landscapes, which is his topic with us today. It is truly our honor to have him here with us, and we thank Union Station for this partnership and enabling us to do this set of programs. And this is the, the bright side of 2020, that without Zoom, we wouldn't be able to bring you here from, uh, from Britain. So thank you for being with us, and we really look forward to the next hour of learning with you, Dr. Cole. Great, thank you so much. That's a very kind introduction, um, Jessica, and it's a real delight to be able to join you in um, in Kansas City from um, from Bristol, England, um, through the um, the genius of um, of Zoom and the World Wide Web. Um, what I want to do is, um, in a sense, take us on a journey um, for the next um, forty five minutes or so, um, and to take us um, through a variety of different landscapes um, where the Holocaust was enacted, but also where it um, has been evaded. Um, and in some ways, I, I guess we'll, we will get to Auschwitz, um, the, the, the place that's foregrounded within um, the exhibition that many of you will have um, seen or will be seeing um, very shortly um, in Union Station. Um, but I wanted to take us to um, some other places as well, maybe some less familiar um, landscapes and to think a little bit about how um, the Holocaust was a genocide that was kind of constantly on the move. Um, so it, it was enacted within um, a place like Auschwitz, um, and that's the story the exhibition tells um, of the uh, murder of um, uh, well over a million Jews in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, within German-occupied Poland um, during the context of the war. Um, but as I want to suggest, this was a genocide that was constantly evolving um, and it, it evolved and changed shape as it moved across the European um, landscape. So we'll return to Auschwitz, um, but I wanted us to start um, somewhere else. This is a, um, a rather out of date map now. The maps that I'm using are mainly from um, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum um, collection. Um, it's a, a map that captures some of the major ghettos um, within Europe. And I guess that's a, a good place to start in many ways. If we're thinking about this um, genocide, the Holocaust, it makes sense to start in um, uh, the landscape um, of the ghettos. Um, and I want to think a little bit about Warsaw, um, one of the largest um, uh, cities in occupied um, Poland, and certainly with a very large Jewish population um, when it's occupied in 1939. Ghettos eventually set up there in the fall of, uh, of 1940. One thing I've always been struck by is I've been struck by the um, the recollections of this um, young Jewish woman um, who um, lived uh, and grew up in in Warsaw, a woman called Yanina Bauman. And she talks about how um, her family, like so many of her Jewish families in 1940, um, faced what she termed a new question. So there was a, a new set of questions that the occupation, and in particular, the creation of a ghetto in their city, separating out Jews from non-Jews, um, uh, raised. And, and the question that she asked um, is a question that she said Jewish families across the entire city were asking in the fall of 1940. And I think from our perspective, it seems a little bit of a strange question to ask. It seems slightly odd that in 1940, someone was asking, um, would it be better to go into the ghetto, to move into the ghetto, or would it be better to hide out on the Aryan side? Because we know what happens next, don't we? And that's very much, I guess, what the exhibition um, in Kansas City at the moment shows us, is it shows us what happened next. Um, the uh, decision to kill Jews en masse, not just Polish Jews like Janina Bauman and her family, but Jews from all the way across occupied Europe and to kill them um, through the creation of, uh, of gas chambers, um, through uh, the kind of mass killing uh, that's seen in a place like Auschwitz. But all of that is, is distant at this point in, um, in October and November 1940. And so this question that from our perspective seems an odd question to ask is a very real question. And it's one thing that I've been struck by as I've been trying to think a little bit about the Holocaust as a kind of geographical and spatial event, as well as a historical and chronological event, is that oftentimes I think um, Jews caught up in the genocide um, and non-Jews as well were making decisions about where was safer or not as safe, where to go, whether to go here 
or whether to go there. And so this family was one of many families in a city where the German authorities have decided to separate Jews and non-Jews out into these separate um, uh, quarters of the city, who are deciding whether to try and hide on the so-called Aryan side amongst Polish neighbors, or whether to move in uh, to the ghetto with their um, Jewish neighbors and, and friends. Um, Yanina's family um, think that they have some things going for them. Uh, they're a, a relatively well-off middle-class family. They've got some good connections with the non-Jewish world, but they're not entirely sure that they're going to be able to survive out on the Aryan side. And so what they do is they decide that there's no other option for them but to move with the rest of the Jews of Warsaw um, into um, the ghetto. Now, again, I think what's surprising is what Yanina says next. So it's surprising in some ways that this is a, a question that's been asked in 1940. Should we go into the ghetto or should we try and hide out on the Aryan side? But it's also surprising in many ways that when Yanina moves into this um, flat, um, that she talks about it being bad, but perhaps not too bad. Different, thus exciting. For her family, um, this is definitely very different to her experience of growing up in a, a relatively well-off family within um, Warsaw, living in a, a nice apartment. Suddenly now they're removed to much poorer quality housing. And this is typical of the ghettos that are set up by the Nazis within Europe, that poor quality housing is given to Jews and much better housing is given uh, to non-Jews. And in the case of Warsaw to um, Germans uh, and German soldiers. But it's not just poor quality housing, it's incredibly cramped. And one of the things that emerges very quickly is the challenge of that, uh, of living in overcrowded conditions, especially for Yanina as she starts to date her boyfriend um, for the first time. She falls in love, but there's nowhere where there can be any privacy for this, this young couple. But there's a, a, an element of kind of relative normality at the beginning of Yanina's story, that things are bad, but perhaps not too bad when the family decide that all they can do is move into the ghetto. But as she quickly discovers, things turn um, much more deadly within a few months. And that, I think, is one of the things that happens as a result of this policy of ghettoization that the Nazis um, uh, implement across um, occupied Poland. I think what they do when they set up ghettos is they really do two things um, that I think are very much spatial things. They're kind of geographical ideas, in a sense. One is to cut off a community. So to create a wall, in this case, a big brick wall around the ghetto, separates out Jews from non-Jews uh, and Jews from Poles and Jews from Germans. And one thing that that allows is it allows for the Nazis to control the amount of food that's coming into the ghetto. And essentially what they do is they set up starvation rations within this ghetto, um, that there's a differential uh, amount of food that's being given to Germans within the city, to Poles, lesser than Germans, and then to Jews right at the bottom. Um, who are being granted a ration that's completely inadequate for life. The result is um, that for families like Yanin, is the only way to survive within the ghetto for any period of time is to um, partake in the black markets. Smugglers are smuggling food into the ghetto. The majority of the food that's eaten in the Warsaw ghetto is smuggled in food. But it's obviously easier to buy on the black market if you're a Jew um, of, of means with some wealth than those um, without means. And so one of the things that Yanina becomes used to is seeing um, the, the bodies of those who starve to death on the streets um, of this ghetto. But the other thing that walling in Jews, segregating Jews from non-Jews, is that also there's an opportunity here that the Nazis take to limit the amount of space given to um, Jews. Um, the ghetto is a place of, of terrible overcrowding, and that's something that Yanina um, experiences um, right at the beginning, as, as, as they enter into this new apartment for the first time, they find that they have to live in the hallway of the apartment because every single room is taken. People are living in the kitchen, people are living in the bathroom, people are, like their family are living um, in the hallway. And in the context of overcrowding, um, there's the break, outbreak of epidemics. Um, in particular, in the summer of 1941, there's a real spike in the death rate um, in the Warsaw Ghetto as a result of epidemics brought on by overcrowded um, conditions. And so as Janina quickly realizes, life in the ghetto is life that's threatened by these twin um, challenges, the twin threats of disease and of starvation. But one thing that isn't happening in the ghetto is the kind of mass murder of Jews on the scale 
of a place like Auschwitz-Birkenau, the place that the exhibition that many of you have seen or will be seeing focuses in on and I'll return to in a moment. What's happening in the ghettos across occupied Poland is that Jews are dying, but they're not being killed in the, in the kinds of ways that they are killed later on in the war. It's, it's much more a story of Jewish death than of, of, of genocide, of the mass murder of an entire ethnic group of, of all Jews. And there's, there's still some persistence of semi-normality. This period, Yanina is still living in an apartment. She's not living in the barracks of a camp like Auschwitz. She's living in an apartment, although it is a strange apartment. It's the apartment of a stranger. And it's a strange apartment because it's so overcrowded and it's not the kinds of living conditions um, that she's used to. But the, the story of genocide, the story of, of a shift, if you like, from Jews dying to Jews being murdered, is one that really starts to take place um, in the ways that Jessica just mentioned when Operation Barbarossa breaks out in 1941. And so in a sense, I think, to start understanding the genocide, we kind of have to move eastwards. We've got to, in some ways, follow the German military as they occupy Soviet Russia in 1941. And we need to leave Poland for a moment and we need to enter into um, the eastern part of Poland and into the Soviet territory, because this is the place uh, where um, the genocide really begins, where a policy, if you like, of Jews dying um, becomes a policy of Jews being murdered um, en masse. But again, at this moment, I think, Operation Barbarossa, June 21st, 1941, when um, the Germans enter into Soviet-held territory and push the the, um, the the Russian army well back eastwards um, uh, to uh, uh, to the very edges of um, of, of, of Soviet power. Um, in in this period, where there's there's a rapid um, overrunning of of this area of of Europe, I think Jewish families are still asking questions about where to go, where's safe and not safe, even in the summer an autumn of 1941. And maybe I can give you one example from um, this man's family, uh, uh, the, the late Earl Grief, uh, recently sadly died, um, who's a survivor of, of the Holocaust in this region, this, this um, former Soviet territory overrun by the Nazis um, 80 years ago um, today. Earl's from a, a, a Jewish family, um, mum and dad, Isaac and, and, and Miriam. He's got a couple of sisters, um, Reisel's his older sister, Devorah is his little um, his little baby sister, and then he's got one brother close in age um, and very close to um, uh, as well. Now what's always struck me about this particular family is that just as the Germans are advancing into Soviet territory, this is a family as well which is asking, well should we stay or should we go? Is it going to be safer to try and stay here in our community um, or is it going to be safer to try and flee eastwards um, ahead of um, the, um, the retreating Soviet army and to head east into, into Soviet territory? What's really striking is that this family comes to a, a decision. They kind of have this family meeting, which is very much what Yanina suggesting in Warsaw, that the family sits around to ask this question, to discuss this question. Where should we go? Should we go into the ghetto or should we try and hide out on the Aryan side? Exactly the same thing happens for Earl's family. They sit down and they have this discussion about whether they stay or whether they go. Where's the safe place um, to move? And what they decide is they decide that the eldest daughter, Reisel, should go eastwards into the Soviet territory and the rest of them should stay. Now, I guess the question is, well, why that? Why decide to send one east and the rest of the family decide to stay? What's really interesting, I think, at this moment is that um, they make this decision because Reisel is not just Jewish, but Reisel is also a card carrying member of the Communist Party. So she um, has uh, become caught up in, in revolutionary politics um, in this region and she's joined the Communist Party. And so the family decide that a young communist like Reisel is likely to be threatened by Nazi Germany. And therefore, the safest place for a young communist like Reisel is for her to head eastwards whilst the rest of the family stay. Again, this might seem strange to us, you know, from our perspective, because we know what happens next in the story. We know what happens at Auschwitz-Birkenau. But for this family, what's really striking, I think, is at this moment in June 1941 is that they assume 
that whilst communists may well be the enemies of Nazism and someone like Reisel may well be threatened by German advance into their territory, they assume that the Nazis will not threaten Jews in quite the same way. And therefore the family decide to stay. But things start to get worse. Um, a ghetto is created in their community. And again, like Yanina's family, they have to make the decision about whether it's safer to stay in the ghetto or to um, try and hide outside. What's really striking, I think I've always thought about this family is that they, in a sense, adopt almost a kind of seasonal pattern that they decide in the spring and the summer that it's best to hide out in the forest and not go into the ghetto in 1942, but quickly by the autumn, the fall and, and winter of 1942, life in the forest becomes so hard, it's so hard to find food. Um, it's so hard to keep warm without smoke giving away your presence in, uh, in hiding in the forest that they, they head into the ghetto. And ultimately it's in the ghetto um, where this family um, is, uh, is murdered. Um, not all of the family, um, but many, of its members. It's a, it's a typical story of these small ghettos that are set up in, in Soviet territory in, in 41 and 42, um, that there's a, a moment often where there's a, an action, a kind of roundup. Um, and in the case of this particular um, family, the mum, Miriam and the little baby, um, Devorah, are taken to a forest just on the edge of the, of the village and are shot into a, a mass grave, like so many of us, um, as Jessica reminded us, killed um, in this so-called Holocaust by bullets um, in 1941 and 1942 within former Soviet territory. Earl and Liebel um, escape with their father and they go and hide in the forest. The father is ultimately killed, but Earl and his brother um, manage to survive the war. Now, two things really strike me about this moment in 1941 and 1942, where if you like, the, the genocide begins, where a policy of, of ghettoization, of separating Jews out and of reducing the amount of food Jews have, of overcrowded conditions that lead to, to epidemics, that there's a radicalization of that policy that takes place um, within this period and time. It's, it's what I guess we term and know as the Holocaust, this shift to a policy of, of mass murder. And it takes place, as Jessica reminded us, um, in the aftermath of Operation Barbarossa, as um, the German forces occupy um, this region. Historians still um, dispute exactly when the decision is made, sometime in the summer um, or autumn, certainly um, fall or winter of 1941. Maybe a radicalization initially focused around a decision to kill Polish Jews and then gradually European Jews. But there's a, a radicalization that takes place late in 1941 as the Germans overrun this place. And you can start to see this on the ground as increasingly it's not just communists that are being shot by the Germans, but it's Jews. And it's not just Jewish men who could be partisans and a threat to the military, but it's Jewish women and Jewish children, including uh, Miriam and, and Devorah. But the other thing that, that really strikes me about this moment where the genocide begins is that this is a very different genocide from the genocide um, uh, of Auschwitz-Birkenau, the genocide that you'll see um, uh, when you go to the exhibition. Because this is a genocide that is almost like, I imagine it as a kind of genocide in the neighborhood. The thing that's so striking about this family, Isaac, Miriam, Earl, Liebel and Devorah, is that all of them either are murdered or hide just a few miles from the family home. They're not transported across the entire European continent in the way um, that Jews were to somewhere like Auschwitz, but they're killed uh, very close to home, often in sight of their neighbors and sometimes with the help of their neighbors. The late Raoul Hilberg talks about the way that there's almost these two genocides, one in the East, which isn't just a, a, a Holocaust by bullets, but it's a Holocaust, which is this much more dispersed event where the killers uh, move village by village um, through Jewish communities um, and shoot uh, Jews very close to their homes. And then there's this second Holocaust, the Holocaust, which the exhibition that many of you will see uh, talks about, which is this moment where there's almost the creation of, of centralized killing sites and the movement of Jews initially from Poland and then from across the European continent um, to a number of, of camps. And that's where we should go ourselves. 
the the story i think is a is a familiar one of the creation of a of a handful of 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 purpose built um killing sites in occupied poland by the germans um a, a kind of experimental killing site in helmo um right at the end of 41 and into 42 where jews from Łódź are taken um and then three very large um killing sites at treblinka at shobibor and belzets in the east of poland and it's treblinka where jews from warsaw are taken although not yanina's family at, at this point Yanina's family realized that it's no longer safe to be in the ghetto and so they leave the ghetto um but hundreds of thousands of jews are taken from warsaw um in july through september 1942 to treblinka um where probably around 900,000 Jews are killed um in in just over a year and then Auschwitz the place that's the focus of the exhibition that many of you have seen or will see which is I guess the the camp that enters into the popular imagination in part because it's the camp where the most are killed but it's also the camp um that no no longer just serves as a place of, of murder for Poland's Jews, but serves as a place of murder for Jews um, brought um, from uh, the entire way around um, the European continent. Now there's so much that can be said about Auschwitz um, and the exhibition that many of you have seen or will see um, uh, will uh, say so much about um, this particular camp. What I want to do is I want to just focus on two um, things um, that maybe reflect my own kinds of interests as someone who's interested in, if you like, the intersection of history and geography, thinking about uh, a genocide that doesn't just happen in a particular time but also happens in particular places and spaces. And the first is some work that I've done with some colleagues. Um, this is work by um, Paul Jascott, um, who's uh, uh, an architectural historian from um, Duke, um, uh, as part of a project that we did, uh, a bigger book called Geographies of the Holocaust. And one of the things that um, Paul did was he worked through the architectural um, archive of Auschwitz and started to, to map it out. Um, this is Auschwitz-Birkenau um, with the main gateway at the bottom, uh, the rail tracks running up to the two main crematoria up at the top left and then stretching out um, into the, the main camp over on the right um, and Canada um, up in the, in the top of the, of the image. And what Paul was really interested in doing was he was interested in trying to map out which of these buildings were under construction in 1943 and 1944. This is one year of construction in Auschwitz-Birkenau between May 1943 and May 1944, which is when many of the prisoners who were sent to Auschwitz, many of the Jews that are sent to Auschwitz um, are sent to this camp. And what I think his, his work shows and suggests to us is that one of the ways we should think about Auschwitz is um, in, in some ways as a place that's always under construction, always becoming, always being created, always being made, never finished, but a work in progress. On this map, what he does in, uh, on this plan is he, he sketches out in, in red all of the buildings that were being constructed during this period. And as you can see, that's the vast majority of buildings within Birkenau. That arriving in Auschwitz was to arrive in um, a construction site and a death camp. That Auschwitz-Birkenau was always both at the same time. And that's where survivors talk so much about mud, about the mud um, that sucked them in during the wet winters and the dust that it was turned to in the dry um, summers. Auschwitz-Birkenau was built on a, on a marsh and it seemed to many survivors that it was not just the Germans conspiring to kill them, but it seemed like the mud itself was threatening to suck them in. And I'll return to that idea a little bit later. So Auschwitz is this muddy construction site as well as a, a death camp and also labor camp and concentration camp. But there's something else that I think is, is really important to think about when we think about Auschwitz, which is to move, if you like, from focusing on the mud, the kind of very materiality of the soil in which it's built, to think much broader than that. And maybe just to do that, I can introduce you to another family. These are um, three sisters. Um, so on the, the left um, there, you've got Renya. And then in the middle, um, you've got um, Chris. And then um, on the right, you've got um, Hanya, Anna. 
Locke's family, uh, a, a bunch of, um, of Jewish girls um, from uh, um, central Poland. Uh, they grow up in central Poland. Um, like other Polish Jews, like Yanina's family, they end up in the in the ghetto. They end up working in a, a slave labor camp um, in Poland. Um, but in 1944, they're brought to Auschwitz um, Birkenau, um, as so many Jews are. Now, one thing that's really striking, I think, in, in the story that these girls tell is that they suggest that it was this moment when they're taken to Auschwitz-Birkenau that they suddenly realize for the first time that there's a continental-wide genocide taking place. In a sense, I think it's only in Auschwitz that they realize for the first time that there's this thing called the Holocaust taking place this continental scale attempt to murder all Jews in occupied Europe. Prior to this point, these girls have um, lived in a, a small town in, in the center of Poland. And they have kind of imagined that what's happening to them is just happening to them. They, they don't have much sense of what's happening around them in the wider world, that it's much more within this particular um, community that they're aware um, that Jews are, are being um, persecuted, but they don't have much sense of what's happening elsewhere. Their, their mother um, is rounded up and disappears and they don't know where she disappears to. They're unsure of, of where she goes. But they arrive in Auschwitz and they suddenly realize that it's not just Jews in their little town that are being persecuted, but it's Jews all the way across the European continent. Because one of the things that's so striking, I think, for Jews arriving in Auschwitz, this is something you see in Primo Levi's work where he talks about Auschwitz as Babel or Babel, is that it's a place where languages from all the way across the European continent are, are spoken. Some time ago, I did a little bit of work looking at one of the surviving barracks books from um, 22B in the women's camp. And what's so striking, I think, when you look at that list of names of Jews, Jewish women that are living within that barracks, is that they literally come from north, south, east and west. Um, that there's uh, more than 20 different linguistic groups within that barracks. And, and Jews like these three girls arriving in a barracks like that may not be able to understand what others are saying, but what they do quickly understand by the very fact that 21 different languages are represented there is that Jews from all over Europe are being murdered. And it's at this moment that these three girls realize that what has been happening to their little community in Poland is something so much bigger, something that we know as the Holocaust. It's there, I think, that they start to understand that for the first time. And for them, the real tragedy of this is that they start to realize what has happened um, to their mother who left them just a few months before taken from the market square in their town, they start to realize that their mother is probably not going to, to return. Now that, that expansion to, to European-wide genocide in a few killing sites in occupied Poland is one that draws on the European um, train network, on this kind of uber modern uh, piece of technology, almost the kind of pride of Europe in the um, interwar period um, that connects Europe um, uh, in many ways for the first time um, uh, in the 19th century. It's suddenly used to connect Auschwitz-Birkenau to places near and far. Um, Jews from as far south as, as Salonika, from Greece, are packed into train cars and are transported um, hundreds of miles um, to Auschwitz in these lengthy journeys. Now, in some ways, we can think about the Holocaust as the kind of most modern of crimes. And that is certainly part of the story that you find in a place like Auschwitz. And the exhibition that many of you have seen or will see does talk about that. One of the things that um, Robert Jan van Pelt, uh, an architectural historian who's been key in putting the exhibition together, really focuses in on the kind of ways in which um, engineers and architects um, are drawn into the genocide um, to create ways of, of murdering. But as well as thinking of, of this as, as the most modern of crimes in this phase where it shifts from a Holocaust by bullets to a Holocaust by gassing, there's also, I think, a kind of persistence of something that's far from modern about these um, train journeys. One thing that struck me as I um, interviewed survivors and listened to survivors' stories um, as they talked about these train journeys was how these were not stories that were expansive uh, or were about mobility or modernity or movement. 
but these were stories that were incredibly enclosed and almost claustrophobic in the way that they were told. And time and time again, survivors, as they told a story of being taken to Auschwitz, told a story focused around two buckets. It was as if their entire world had shrunk to the point where the story was one of two buckets, one that was full and became empty, one that was empty and became full and overflowing. The first, a bucket of water put into the cattle car um, at the beginning of the journey, which was quickly drunk, in particular in the summer of 1944, uh, when Hungarian Jews were on the move um, in a hot continental summer. And the other, an empty bucket um, put there as a toilet that became full and then quickly became overflowing, reducing these carts to places that were primarily experienced um, through not just smell, but through um, stench. There's a sense here at this moment of the Holocaust, this genocide on a massive continental scale, which is a story of movement, of movement of, of, of well over a million Jews from all the way across the European continent to Auschwitz-Birkenau, a place where, like the Locks family, Jews suddenly discover this is a continental scale murder. But I think that moment is also a moment of a terrible shrinking in um, that these stories of two buckets um, tell. But it's, it's not at Auschwitz that the story ends. The, the story continues, and in a sense, the genocide once more is on the move in 1945. And it, it takes to the road network um, of Europe as the camps in the east are evacuated, in particular Auschwitz-Birkenau evacuated in the middle of January 1945. Um, and the so-called death marches or evacuations of camp populations um, uh, take place in the, um, in the winter, the cold um, Polish winter um, of 1945 along snow-covered um, roads. One, one thing that you could see this as is you could see this as a kind of breakdown, as a complete breakdown of the camp system. But I prefer to see it as in some ways a kind of continuation of the camp system. But it's, it's more now that is as if the camps themselves have taken to the road. And what my colleague Simone Gigliotti talks, mobile confinement, is this new phase of the genocide, this very strange phase of the genocide. When Auschwitz is evacuated in 1945, and it takes to the road. It's not just the prisoners themselves that take to the road, it's in many ways the entire camp that takes to the road. It's almost as if a kind of barracks is moved from the camp and becomes a kind of mobile barracks on um, the road network of, of Europe as Jews are being marched westwards to an ever decreasing number of camps. Gone is, is the barbed wire that surrounds um, uh, the camp but it's been replaced instead with another deadly boundary, another deadly border. As, as many of you know, I'm sure, and, and find out, one of the things about the barbed wire around Auschwitz is that it's electrified. It's sometimes a, a place where Jews um, throw themselves and commit suicide. Um, it's a place where um, Jews are shot as they, as they try and escape um, from the camp. And, and that boundary, that deadly boundary that surrounds Auschwitz-Birkenau becomes a new kind of deadly boundary as the camp takes to the road en masse, 60,000 uh, or more prisoners on the roads in January 1945 from, from Auschwitz alone. And, and the, the barbed wire fence is replaced, if you like, by the sight lines of guards um, with their, um, with their uh, rifles trained upon um, Jews. But there's a, there's a shift, which is that it, it's, it, escape is now being read as just simply not being able to keep up with the pace. As Jews are unable to, um, famished prisoners are unable to keep up with the pace, then they're, they're shot by the side of the road. There's a return, if you like, at this moment to a kind of holocaust by bullets um, within the very ordinary landscapes of the roadsides of occupied Poland, of um, the Czech Republic, um, of uh, Germany and um, Austria. There's a, a moment where um, the genocide starts to enter into Germany, a place where the killings haven't really taken place until this point in time because they've taken place much further east. Um, but suddenly not just prisoners, um, but also the shootings of prisoners are happening outside the windows of ordinary Germans in um, 1945. Now for, for some, 
the, the death marches are their experience, the evacuations are their experience of um, the first half of 1945. Um, Nina Kaleshka here is an example of that. She, she feels like she's walking around and around in circles in an ever decreasing amount of territory that's still under German um, uh, hands as the Americans and the Brits come from the West and the Soviets come from the East. She ultimately is liberated walking around and around in circles in this kind of mobile camp on, on the move. In some ways, she's one of the lucky ones um, because, in a sense, one of the worst things to do is to end up in one of the overcrowded camps um, within German soil um, in 1945, where you get this kind of final phase or final moment of, um, uh, of almost a kind of reassertion of the camps within um, the European landscape of a kind of new camp experience um, in uh, 1945. Now, one of the things that um, one of my colleagues, um, Anne um, Kelly Knowles, as part of this bigger geographical project, this sort of mapping project that we've done, did, was she um, worked with the, um, the, the encyclopedia of SS camps um, created by the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., and she started to map that out. And, and when she first showed me um, these maps, um, uh, 1938, 1939, 1942, 1944, one thing I was so struck by was that the, the vast majority of camps, of concentration camps, are not created very early in the war, but they're created right at the end of the war. There's this flurry of the creation of camps in 1944, as there's a kind of shift in Nazi policy away from pure murder of Jews that characterizes a place like Treblinka, um, where Jews from Warsaw are sent, to a shift to selections on the rampart Auschwitz and deployment of Jews seen as fit for labor into the slave labor economy. And there's this kind of shift, I guess, in focus of almost a, an, an attempt to fight um, the war, to shift Jews into the munitions industry. And so there's a whole range of camps that are created, tiny in many ways, labor camps that are created all the way across Germany. Um, in 1944 uh, and 45. And, and Germany no longer is Juden Fries, no longer free of Jews, the Jews that have been moved out in 1941 to the ghettos in the East. There's a kind of return of Jews, a mass return of Jews as slave laborers in 1944 and 45 into these camps. And then another wave of Jews that are being moved in these evacuations, these death marches along the road network of, of Europe into these camps, which become more and more overcrowded. Um, they're camps that are familiar to many of us within the Western world because they're the camps that, that Western soldiers um, liberate. Um, if you know um, uh, the famous photograph at the beginning of the, um, the exhibition in, in, in USHMM is of one of those camps um, and the narrative is, is of one of those camps, there's photographs there of places like Dachau that American soldiers liberate, or in the British context, um, Bergen-Belsen, which um, British um, uh, soldiers liberate in, in April uh, 1945. These are the kind of final Holocaust landscape, I think, in this genocide that's been on, on the move. A genocide that moves eastwards and then heads westwards. Right in the far west, back on German soil, there's a kind of final, final phase of murder. But it's a, a return, I think, almost to um, dying rather than, than killing. One of the things that really struck me as I listened to um, hundreds of survivor interviews um, is that, that oftentimes um, uh, the person interviewing the survivor, um, in particular someone who's been through multiple camps, um, and especially they've been to Auschwitz, will say to them a question like, so of all the camps you went to, which was the worst? Uh, seems like a strange question to ask, but it was a question that interviewers often did ask. And the answer was generally not Auschwitz. So most people, when they answered that question, did not say Auschwitz was the worst camp. They said that it was actually one of these camps right at the end of the war where they were dumped in um, March, April, May 1945. Uh, in the case of the Locke sisters, those three girls who arrived at Auschwitz, they ended up in a place called Ravensbrück. And when asked that question by their interviewer, they said it was Ravensbrück that was the worst camp we were in. It wasn't Auschwitz, it was Ravensbrück. In the case of um, this woman, Fela uh, Vorschau, it was Bergen-Belsen. Again, she said it was Bergen-Belsen that was the worst camp, it wasn't Auschwitz. And I was really intrigued by that. I was interested in, in well, why do survivors um, distinguish between camps? Why do they see these camps right at the end of the war, these kind of dumping grounds um, for Jews in the, the ever decreasing space of the German Reich right at the end of the war? Why do they see them as the worst? And I think 
Vela Vorschau um, really sums that up in a way that um, was captured in the narratives of others that I, I listened to, which was she felt like um, there was there was something worse than organized killing. Organized killing by gassing was terrible. Um, and she'd seen enough of that um, as she was taken through Auschwitz-Birkenau. But there felt something almost more terrifying, which was chaotic dying in a place like Bergen-Belsen, where it seemed not, not just that people weren't fed anymore, or there wasn't any work anymore, or that there, there wasn't any, any roll calls anymore, um, that, but there wasn't any, there weren't gas chambers, there weren't graves, there was just death. And, and she suggested in her narrative, and this is something that I saw in a number of narratives, was almost that it felt like death itself had kind of assumed almost a kind of agency, like the, the agency of the mud that was threatening to suck survivors, uh, Jews, into the, the, the marshes of Birkenau. It's, it felt like death itself had assumed that kind of agency. And it felt like humans were no longer in control and that death itself was in control in a camp like Bergen-Belsen right at the end uh, of the war. Just two closing thoughts. What I've tried to do, hopefully, is to try and suggest that this um, is a genocide that takes place in all sorts of places, in camps and ghettos, on the road, in forests. Um, and it moves, it moves broadly eastwards and then westwards across um, the course of the war. This was a genocide that was constantly on the move. And that in that context, Jews themselves were constantly on the move. Partly they were being transported places in, in cattle cars, in the case of Jews from Salonika taken to Auschwitz. But they were also making decisions about where to go, like Yanina's family or like Earl's family. They were trying to work out where was safe and where was less safe. Um, that, 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 that mobility and movement is a really important story and an important part of this story. But I want to suggest just two things in closing about this kind of eastward-westward story, which I think does characterize um, the Holocaust. The Holocaust is a story that starts in the east, as um, Jessica reminded us, with Operation Barbarossa 80 years ago today. But it ends in the west, in Germany, in the overcrowded camps of places like Dachau and, and Belsen. In some ways, that journey was then taken in reverse by survivors. What you tended to find is that survivors headed first east and then often back west again in the aftermath of the war. That there's a continuation, if you like, of movement. Um, the Lock sisters, I think, are a great example of that. They end up, as I've said, in, in Ravensbrück. Um, they want to know what's happened to their father. They last saw him um, in Auschwitz-Birkenau, in the ramp at Auschwitz-Birkenau, where men are sent one way and women the other. And so what they decide to do, like so many survivors, is to go home. It makes sense to return to their um, community in, in central Poland to see if they can find their father um, there. And so they, they battle um, to get back east from Ravensbrück um, in Germany back to um, Poland. Uh, they um, try and get onto overcrowded trains. Um, they try and get transport. They walk. Um, and finally, they make it back to Łódź in, um, in western Poland. They meet um, a, a family member, a distant family member, a relative there. They tell um, him of their plans. He says, I wouldn't do that. I don't think it's very safe in, um, in those small um, communities. Um, uh, and he suggests that they, they don't do it. They decide to ignore his advice and they return home and they, they find um, that there's no Jews left in their community and they head back to Wodz um, that night because uh, they know that they're not welcome. And they quickly realize uh, that not only their mother's dead, but their father is dead. But like so many of the Jews who've headed first east, they also head back west. They head back to camps that have now been repurposed as displaced persons camps before ultimately, in their case, heading further west to North America, to the United States and to Canada um, uh, in uh, the mid and late 1940s. So there's a sense of movement continuing. These girls that are, are taken from the east to the west, return east and then return west in the aftermath of um, the war. It's a genocide, if you like, that continues to reverberate and continues to move, um, that Jews themselves continue to be on the move as they try again to find somewhere safe, as they try again to find somewhere that they can call home. In the end, for, for those three, home 
was not where they were born and brought up, but home became a place uh, much further west across the Atlantic. But there's a sense, I think, of this kind of sense of reverberations of a sort of eastwards, westwards shift, also characterizing the ways that we encounter and understand um, the Holocaust. And that's maybe where I can just finish. In, in many ways, I think, if you, if you try and think of the last 80 years since this genocide took place, I think we, as, as humans, as, as people, often most of us born after this event, in places maybe far removed from this event, that most of us, I think, have also ourselves imaginatively, collectively taken a journey um, from west to east, just like the journey that, um, that the sisters took, the Lock sisters in the aftermath of the Holocaust, and in a sense have taken the journey of the Holocaust itself in reverse. And by that, I mean that, that I think in many ways in the Western world, and I'm thinking here particularly of me in, in Bristol, England, of you in Kansas City, United States, is that in, in our imagination, I think the initial encounter with the Holocaust in Britain and the United States is through the landscapes of Dachau and Bergen-Belsen. It's through the camps that were liberated by British and American soldiers in 1945. And in particular, it's through the searing images taken in those camps that many of us have seen and few of us forget. That in a sense, our encounter with the Holocaust, with the genocide, begins, I think, with the very last place where the Holocaust and genocide took place. And also, in many ways, I think the least representative place of the whole story. I think in the 1960s, things shift, that there's a, a sort of shift in the, in the Western imagination, if you like, the way that we in Britain and the United States um, imagine the Holocaust, it sort of recenters, it refocuses, it moves from Dachau and Bergen-Belsen to Auschwitz in the 1960s. You can see this in popular culture, um, that Auschwitz becomes an increasingly common reference point in the 1960s. Um, and it, it shifts from the piles of, of corpses um, that are hastily buried by British and American troops in 1945 in mass graves to industrialized mass killing. There's a moment, I think, in the 1960s where Auschwitz is as far as we get, if you like, in our imagination. And we imagine the Holocaust as primarily about uber modernity, about mass killing um, in gas chambers. I think in the 1990s and in the 2000s, we get a little bit further east in the popular imagination. We shift further eastwards and we start to enter into former Soviet territory where there's a Holocaust by bullets. And we start to encounter the stories of um, Jews shot very close to their homes, not just within the neighborhood, but within sight of their neighbors or with the help of their neighbors. In some ways, I think, imaginatively, we in the Western world have kind of finally ended up where the genocide started. It's taken us a long time, but we finally ended up where it began. Now, in, in a sense, as I've suggested, the genocide isn't just one place or one thing. It always was constantly on the move. And so the genocide is Dachau and Belsen and is Auschwitz and is a small forest outside a Jewish community um, in the, the east of Poland and the Western fringes of the Soviet territory. But maybe it's taken us a long time to realize that, to realize the complexity of this thing called the Holocaust, um, this genocide that, as I've suggested, was always constantly on the move um, and changed shape. And that, I think, presented deep challenges for those um, like Earl's family or Yanina's family or the Locke sisters who were always looking for somewhere safe and somewhere to call home. Let's stop there. Thank you, Dr. Cole, for that wonderful presentation. I think we all learned a lot and especially uh, helped us sort of reframe our understanding as we approach the Holocaust from different uh, discipline uh, approaches. And that's maybe where, I, where I'd like to start our question. Just as a broad big picture question, if you could describe maybe a bit about your methodology and how you approach, um, how you get at this intersection of geography and history. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, I think one of the things that um, I've, 
I, I guess we could all agree on is that um, nothing happens um, in a vacuum. Nothing happens um, in a kind of abstract space. Everything happens in, in real places. Um, and those real places have a, a kind of material form to them and they have a, a politics to them and a culture to them. Um, they have a topography to them. Um, that they're always, everything happens in, in real places. And so one thing that I, I guess I've always been interested in is, um, is trying to bring history and geography into conversation. That I think sometimes we can, we can privilege one or the other. So we can privilege history. Um, and I think that's certainly true in, in the Holocaust, in the case of the Holocaust. Often I think um, the big debates amongst historians have been minutiae debates about chronology, about whether the killings um, start in June or July or August or September or October or November or, or December or January, 1941-42. So a lot of the debates have really been about chronology. And I think often the way that we imagine um, past events is we imagine them in, in terms of chronology that we we kind of have a timeline to try and make sense to them and what I don't want to do is I don't want to jettison that because I think as I've suggested I've kind of worked chronologically here through the holocaust but I want to add in something else which is to say actually it, the holocaust didn't just take place in 1940 or 41 or 42 or 43 or 44 or 45 but actually it took place in really different places different kinds of environments in those times and it, it maybe took place for different reasons and the impact upon Jews was different, that it afforded more or less opportunity to, uh, to flee or escape it, that it felt different, it looked different, that it, that it was constantly evolving. And so in a sense, I guess one of the things I'm always interested in suggesting is not just that any historical event changes over time, but any historical event also changes over, over space, over place. And so I guess when I'm listening to survivors, I'm always listening out for not just when they say something happens, but where they say something happens. Um, and, and one of the things I've been doing with my colleagues as well is we've been really interested in trying to use mapping as a way of, of making that visible. To play off the question on mapping, you mentioned at the very beginning of your presentation, you showed one of the USHMM's maps and said this was outdated. Maybe you could say a bit more and explain to everyone uh, why that's outdated and what new information is coming out about the number of camps. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things I think that's been extraordinary in the last um, 10 years or so. Um, it's just a realization of just how many camps and how many ghettos there were um, within Europe and how dispersed um, the Holocaust was. The, the Washington, D.C. Um, uh, uh, historians, they decide what we're going to do is we're going to create a, an encyclopedia of all the camps and we're going to um, create an encyclopedia of all the ghettos. And they kind of feel like it's going to be a relatively straightforward job. And there's going to be a relatively small number, you know, because in a, in a sense, I think, you know, we, we all of us have probably heard of Auschwitz or Bergen-Belsen or Ravensbrück or Treblinka. There's a number of camps we've all heard of. One of the things I think that they're shocked by is just how um, when they start to think about how many camps there are, they start to get quickly into the into the thousands. The camps aren't just measured on on one hand or two hands or hundreds but they start to get you know way over a thousand camps because of the sheer proliferation of camps and the same is true of ghettos i think that again i think many of us could we could name one or two ghettos maybe like somewhere like warsaw or somewhere like watch but actually that there's just so many ghettos so many ghettos that are created across europe and i think one of the things that starting that the mapping is starting to do in some ways is is i think to remind us of the scale of this event um, the scale of the enterprise, um, that this is something um, that happens everywhere rather than just happening in a very few places. Of course, there's certain key nodes, somewhere like Auschwitz is a key node, isn't it, within the camp system. It's absolutely a central place within the Holocaust. But actually, there's, this is a story that spreads across the European wow. continent. And I think as a result, involves so many more people in it than we, we ever imagined. I think one thing their project has helped us to, and if you've pointed out as well, that sort of changing nature of the number of camps that we like to think of them in terms of like there was a static number, but mm -hmm. thinking of them as closing and opening and shifting. And uh, I think that's I think that's a, a surprising thing for lots of people to understand. Yeah, and I think that, that opening and closing, I think, suggests as well, doesn't it, that the, the policy is on the move as well as the genocide. You know, that there's, there's changing ideas of what a camp is for or what a ghetto is for. Um, and that the opening and closing of camps, I think it says a lot about the progress of the war often. You know, Auschwitz ends up as a central camp because of the advanced 
back of the Soviets, you know, in 1942-43. In a sense, Auschwitz is the only place where you can send Jews from Europe, isn't it, by 43? And certainly by 44, when Hungarian Jews are sent there en masse. Um, but the, the opening of these, these labor camps, I think, is one of these really extraordinary moments in the war, um, because I think it does mark a real shift. Um, you know, if you think about a place like Treblinka, where Warsaw Jews are sent in 1942, um, there's no selections, really, in, Warsaw, in, in, in Treblinka. I mean, there's a tiny selection of men to serve in the um, uh, Sonderkommando, Jewish men to, um, to unload the bodies from the gas chamber. But essentially, everyone that arrives at their camp is murdered um, as soon as they arrive. And so if you go to a place like Treblinka, it's tiny as a result, um, because it doesn't need to be big, because most people um, last there 15 minutes, um, 30 minutes. You go to Auschwitz-Birkenau and it's vast. Because by 1944, actually an entire slave labor force is being mobilized. And the story of Auschwitz-Birkenau is being replicated across the German landscape as well. Because this is a point where actually um, life is seen as more valuable than death, but it's a very particular kind of life, isn't it? Which is the life of slave labor, which itself is a, is a death sentence. I think, again, when you think about the vast number, if we're talking almost 44,000 know, ghettos and camps across occupied Europe, the shocking thing to many people is that only six of them were these dedicated killing centers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how geography impacted the type of labor happening in slave labor camps, if it did at all. Yeah, I mean, th there's a there's a big shift, I think, that takes place um, in um, the late 1930s um, when you get a shift from the early camps that are created. Somewhere like Dachau is a really interesting camp, isn't it? Because it's kind of end of the story, but it's early story. So it's it's a camp which is set up as part of the initial concentration camps which are located close to um, uh, main areas of population and are primarily targeted at political prisoners, so political opponents. It's a place, in a sense, to create political uniformity within, within the Reich. One thing I think that's really striking is that suddenly, when you get camps like Matthausen or Flossenburg set up um, in the late 1930s, these aren't close to large areas of population, but they're close to um, quarries. And, and that's, a, that's a shift, isn't it? Because it's not just thinking about, if you like, a camp as a prison where you put a, po a potential opponents to, to ensure uniformity, but it's thinking about the camp as a way of, um, of creating, if you like, a ready flow of workers. Um, and so one of the things that you, sh you start to see, I think, is that camps are not being put next to big cities, but they're being put next to um, infrastructure. They're being put next to quarries at a point in time where this is a moment where th there's a kind of crazed um, notion, I think, isn't there, in Berlin of a thousand year Reich. And there's all of these kind of crazy building projects that Hitler and Speer are embarking on. And so what they're using slave labor for in the late 1930s and early 1940s is for um, quarrying rock and making bricks. So somewhere like Neungamma has a massive brick factory, which still exists. Um, but then there's a shift, I think, somewhere like Auschwitz is, is largely, I think, about agriculture in many ways, that it's a camp that is placed in a place where slave labor is being utilized within the camp system um, uh, to, um, for agricultural purposes to feed the German army. And then there's another shift to munitions, where the camps are set up close to munitions factories, in particular the creation of V1 and V2 rockets. And so one of the things I think that's really interesting, if you think geographically about, if you ask the question, where was a camp? Um, I think where a camp was set up tells you something about priorities, Nazi priorities, which shift from political uniformity through crazy building projects to um, providing um, food for the army to trying to desperately to win the war. And as you said, Shelley, you know, in the middle are these death camps, aren't there? In the middle period in 19, late 41, especially in 42, is this moment where I think there's a kind of in, an incredible focus by Nazi Germany on just genocide, on purely murdering, you know, all of Poland's Jews and ultimately attempting to murder all of, all of Europe's Jews. Thank you. Could you speak a little bit about the uh, routes differing routes on the, the death marches from Auschwitz and why particular ones were chosen for particular groups. Yeah, it's one of the things we, we still don't know enough about. Um, one of the things about the death marches is that um, sometimes it seems that there was some kind of centralized planning. So there was a sense of, um, of, of routes being drawn up um, within um, the hierarchy. But oftentimes it seems that actually um, people were being just um, marched, that those kind of decisions about routes were being taken much more on the ground, um, you know, by those, the, 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 the guards that, that are gardening, guarding those, those groups. Often they'll avoid um, main roads or they'll avoid um, main um, 
areas of occupation, you know, where, where, where um, large um, cities or towns, um, but not entirely. And, and one thing that's really striking, um, some people might have heard of the ITS archive. There's an international tracing um, service that's set up after the war. One of the things that they do after the war is they, they literally send people out to try and find out where these routes were. Um, routes, as you say, don't you, rather than routes, and um, throughout um, occupied Europe, because they're really wanting to try and find out if there are graves along them. Um, and so one of the things they do is they send people on the ground to try and map them out. And there's this amazing set of maps in that collection where we can start to get a picture of where um, these 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 marches um, take place. And one of the things they also do is they um, do a questionnaire, which they send out to um, mayors, to German mayors in, the, in, in different communities. And I think what's really striking there is that quite clearly you see that so many of these, um, these death marches go right through German communities and that these mayors know what this is about. And they also know where the bodies are. They know where people have been shot and they know where people have, have been buried and I think this is the moment where in a sense the genocide really enters into German soil in a very visible way where killing really starts to take place within German soil where Germans see Jews being murdered but I think what's also interesting is that it's the first time often that Jews see Germans and they see Germany so if you think about the Lock sisters you know those three girls that are in central Poland end up in Auschwitz suddenly realize this is continental wide they enter into Germany and they realize that this is a nation on the edge of defeat because they enter into the Reich and they see bombed out cities um, and they see a nation that is about to lose the war. And that gives them a little bit of hope because they think if we can survive, we might make it because we, for the first time, see Germany and we see that Germany is on its knees. Thank you. Um, could you talk a little, you mentioned um, the uses of slave labor in the camps and how that changed according to the needs of the war. Was there a similar thing happening in, in terms of the ghettos at all? Yeah, I think the story of the ghettos is a bit more complex because I think it's less um, systematic. So if you think about the camp system, I think it's, it's much more um, a system which comes under the control of the SS and has much more, if you like, kind of oversight. One of the things that we found out, I think, recently historians about the ghettos is that they're much more um, kind of maverick, that they're much more localized, that they're less systematic, that it, there's, there's a kind of vague order, if you like, around separating Jews out. But it seems that key decisions are being taken on the ground. And so a lot of it depends on, on um, the nature of who um, the, the, the Germans um, are within the locality. So who the kind of bosses, the, the local German bosses. And also a little bit, I think, about um, who the um, Jewish council leadership are within the ghettos, um, the, the Jews that are, that are kind of set up as leaders in the ghettos. And so some of the ghettos are places where you get, like in Łódź in Western Poland, um, like a, a lot of industries set up. And other ghettos, you don't really find that story. And so one thing that, that seems to emerge is that the camps are systematic. And in a sense, it's easier to see shifting policy. The ghettos are much more maverick and much more individualistic. And therefore, I think what, what's interesting about the ghettos is that they maybe give us an insight more into the diversity of approaches taken by different German officials, as well as by German uh, Jewish communities. They're, they're consistently always in the poorest part of town. I'm just spotting a, a, a question that I flashed up on my screen. So the ghettos are always set up in the poorest part of town. I think there's no doubt in my mind um, uh, that this is about robbing Jews. You know, and, and it's about um, getting better quality housing for non-Jews and especially for Germans. Um, there's, there's no doubt at all about that. If you look at somewhere like Krakow, the city of Krakow, the very best housing is reserved for Germans. The next best housing is reserved for Poles. And then the awful housing is reserved for Jews. And that's the story that you find elsewhere. So housing conditions are always terrible. Um, that's one thing that seems to be applied consistently. But whether Jews are working or not working and what kind of work they're involved in seems to be uh, much more variable. Um, and whether the ghettos are more open or closed, there's a lot more vi uh, diversity and variety. So if we think about this as a truly a European event and the, the big sprawl that it had, um, there has to be a lot of infrastructure still left across Europe. So could you speak a bit to um, yeah. what, what these Holocaust landscapes look like today and how maybe you interact with them? Yeah, and I, th I think that's one of the, um, the things, um, Shelley, about taking that kind of geographical approach, a sort of spatial approach, is that in a sense, the Holocaust is kind of still there or the traces of the genocide are still there. So obviously, 2021 is not 1941, is it? Um, th that's 80 years distant. Um, but if you go into um, 
a forest in um, in eastern Poland or in the Soviet western fringes of Soviet Union, um, as someone like say um, uh, uh, the uh, that has happened more recently and starts um, scuffling around in the, in the dirt, then shell casings appear and locals know where the mass grave of Jews is, that the kind of materiality, the physicality of the Holocaust is everywhere. And I, and I think that's one thing that is really striking uh, when you you think geographically, but also when you try and map out the, the, the dispersed nature of the Holocaust. I guess for us, one thing we know is that Auschwitz is still there, don't we? We know that there's so much of Auschwitz that's still there. Um, in the case of Treblinka, um, or Shabibora Belzets or Helmo, those places are raised to the ground um, because uh, of an attempt to hide the crimes and also because the Jews in those in those neighboring communities have already been murdered. So there's kind of no need for a death camp because everyone's been killed. Um, but we often imagine, I think, that there's very few traces left in the landscape, that the, the only traces are a place like Auschwitz or, play, or a place like Maidenek which is a camp that's um, that's liberated more or less extant um, extant by the the Soviets, um, but I think one of the things that I, I'm really interested in by pushing maybe almost our imagination to think about the entire European continent as involved in in the crimes is that actually the traces of of the crimes can be found absolutely everywhere, that they're found on the streets of more or less every European city, and they're found in the forests on the edge of most um, towns in eastern Poland and the Soviet Union, and so in a sense I think the the, the Holocaust landscapes are kind of still there, that the, the Holocaust has left a trace, it, it's left its mark. And I think that's deeply challenging, um, you know, especially for those of us who live in Europe, is the kind of continuing physical proximity of those landscapes. Um, that this was an event a long time ago, you know, a, a human lifespan ago, wasn't it, 80 years ago? But actually it's still very present, I think, within, um, within the streets and, and forests. Um, of Europe. You know, there's more or less maybe no um, roads in large parts of, um, of, of the east of Germany that weren't um, the site of death marches. And, and there's, there's few places where you don't find graves along the roadside where Jews were shot in 1945. You know, it, 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 it's kind of the, the, the landscape is tainted in some ways. Um, and also, I guess, hopefully a place where, where this event isn't, rem isn't forgotten, but is remembered. You know, I guess that's one thing I've, I've always been interested in thinking about. It's not just if we think about landscapes, we don't just think about historical landscapes, but also about landscapes of memory. Well, and to that point, like just as you're saying, there's these different types of, there's the informal ones that might be hidden to the average person's eye, that we don't know that we're walking in the very places where these things happen. And then on the other side of it, we have places of destination like Auschwitz, which mm -hmm. have become massive tourist destinations. Could you speak a little bit about sort of the tricky nature of visiting these places um, and what some people call dark tourism, or there's been yeah. lots in the news about appropriate behavior. And even as we think about, you know, viewing the art, you know, exhibit in our own city, um, how do we balance out coming to these places in terms to be respectful and to learn with the fact that this has now become like a tourist industry? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And it's a question I ask myself, you know, because I take groups to Auschwitz um, uh, because I feel like Auschwitz is a place that I, you know, I kind of feel like I want to take everyone in the world one time in their life. You know, I want everyone to see a place like that, um, to understand a little bit about this event um, and this really important moment in our recent history. Um, but I'm also conscious that there is, as you say, a whole kind of tourist industry um, that develops around it. And I guess there's, you know, challenges for us, I think, as, as, as I guess, why do we go and um, what do we um, see? Um, that we can go as voyeurs, I suppose, or we can go in some ways to learn. And I, I guess I, I tend to um, err on the side of um, now, I think, just saying, okay, let's, I'll take people there. I want, I want to take people there because I want people to learn. And maybe, and maybe that's the, the, the way to approach the exhibition in, in, in your city, isn't it? Is to, is to go with a sense of, of learning, of, of going to try and find out more. Um, uh, and, um, you know, and I think that, that to me is a kind of a, an important part of what it means to be human, is to be, um, to be people who um, try and understand our past, our collective past, um, and try and think a bit about what kind of future we want to make, you know, and how do we make a different future than th that past? You know, in a sense, that to me is is a kind of question that I want to throw out to, you know, to to people that as I take them to Auschwitz, is to show them Auschwitz because it, it happened here, um, but also to invite them to think about what kind of future do we want to build and how do we build that future so it doesn't look like this. 
Absolutely, it has to be a, a, a moment of education um, in addition to, to memory and memorialization. Thank you so much for helping us um, think about the Holocaust in a new way, hopefully. Um, I've certainly learned a lot myself and always thinking about that intersection of history and geography is, is just such a, a useful frame. So thank you, Dr. Cole. Thank all of you for joining us today. Just a quick reminder that our next program will be on July 8th at 6.30, also on Zoom. And that's Dr. Andrew Bergerson talking about uh, the Jews they knew, Nazi violence among friends and neighbors. So um, please come back for that one on July 8th. So thank you again, Dr. Cole. Thank you to our partners at Union Station uh, and to all of you for joining us. Everyone have a, a lovely rest of your afternoon. Thanks so much.